I was terminal. And I had five different doctors tell me I wouldn't make it. I decided, well, I was going to heal myself. Every single person on this planet can do what I do. I have always known that when babies are born, they see energy. But if nobody keeps it alive in that first year of life, it goes dormant. It's about tapping into it again. Energy is all there is. And there's more meaning in everything that comes your way with energy medicine. I've never been afraid of people in my whole life. And I think it's because of partly that, that I see things of such beauty in their souls and in their energies. With the whole world in turmoil as it is, there's this very positive understanding about energy and that we are not just these physical beings. We don't understand it all, but the more you get involved with energy, we are empowered and, and you don't feel so unsafe in this world. I don't think I've ever told anybody this in my life. I've never really taught it, but well, probably it was energy medicine mostly that's kept us really good together and, and getting better and evolving and all of that because it's, it's energy medicine. Well, energy is all there is. You know, there mm. is nothing else. And it really is. It helps you evolve and 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 get happier and lighter. And, and there's more meaning in everything that comes your way with energy medicine. So... Um, yeah, when Donna says energy is all there is, it's like, well, you seem really solid. You don't seem like you're just energy, <laughs> but in there, there are atoms that are really what the structure is made of, and atoms are these electrons circling around these protons, which is energy right at the base of who we are. And so to begin to understand that and to work with the more and more flexible kinds of energies that really shape who we are, how we think, how we act is a um, is a, a great, uh, uh, but, but we didn't start out in agreement about that. Uh, <laughs> why, why don't you say a little bit about how you, you know, kind of were, had to deal with some of some okay. health challenges? Yes, I had health challenges all the way growing up. And then at 16, I got multiple sclerosis and I, it got worse and worse. So I was not walking much uh, by my late 20s. And and because all my organs were breaking down, I had a heart attack at 27. And, um, and in my early 30, 31, 30, 31, I was really told I wouldn't, I, I was terminal. And I had five different doctors tell me I wouldn't make it. And when I think of how much longer I lived and how good it is, but I, I am so much healthier than I was back in those days. And when all, I saw five different specialists who all said that they couldn't help me because it was, it, it they, they don't have a... It was it, a progressive disease and her organs were breaking down with us, the heart attack at 27. And so they, there was nothing else in their toolbox that was going to help. So Donna... So, so on that day that that last doctor said that to me, I decided, well, I was going to heal myself. I just had to because I had two daughters to raise. And so I and knowing that there is more space in us than anything else. There is more space, energy moving. And I know energy and I always did that. I thought, I'll just see what I can do. And it was my my um, quadriceps here, my thighs that had no energy whatsoever to walk. So I put one hand up towards the top of the leg and one around the knee. And I noticed that it only took about three minutes for that energy to hook up. And I thought this is going to be such a snap. I'm going <laughs> to be well immediately. It wasn't quite immediate, but, I, but every day I got better and better on everything. And I found that I had been allergic to everything. I couldn't grow. I couldn't eat anything that grew out of the get ground. Nothing. Fruits and vegetables were just like poison in my body, and all of my allergies went away. And suddenly, I could eat incredible foods. I had my first sandwich because I couldn't eat bread or anything, and it was it was so wonderful. So I mean, I was I had a lot of incentive to keep on with this, and then pretty soon. I mean, everything got better. And well, not, I, not to oversimplify it, it took about two years of experimenting. In all. Yeah. yeah. In all from where she was pretty symptom free. But in those two years, she you were starting with putting her hands on her thighs and feeling the energy move. She began. So that's a principle. Okay. 
if I put my hands and just rest them, then the energy moves between those two points. What else can I do with my hands? Yeah. What else can I do? And what can I do with postures? And so her whole system really in so many ways, that, that was the foundation of it as she, she, you didn't mention that you have always seen energy. Yeah. And she, from, you know, she could, like when she looks at me, <laughs> she sees, she sees what everybody else sees, but you also see. Well, I see his life color. I see, I see the meridians flowing and the chakras, but I, it always embarrasses me a little bit because I don't want anybody to think that I am any better than anybody else and that I have the tools to be able to do energy medicine. That just isn't true. I have always known that when babies are born, they see energy. You pick up a baby, they're looking all around your head because they're seeing your energy. <laughs> <Look at them. laughs> and uh, it's really true. But if nobody keeps it alive in that first year of life, it goes dormant and you don't see anymore. I had a mom that kept it alive. So my brother, my sister and I all saw energy and it was just what was natural. It never occurred to me that the whole world didn't see energy when I was growing up. <laughs> Look at that face. <laughs> it's incredible to feel into how much of a gift that was from your mother as well, because well, yeah, yeah, it's, um, yeah. yeah and, and, You've you've gone through sharing your journey, and you you had a lot of things going on. Like asthma was there, and actually that was the first thing that cleared up, which was a bit surprising yes, asthma. for yes. you as well. And the interesting thing that also you pointed out is it started with hands and awareness of space. So you realized there was space inside, but then also yeah. placing your hands on certain parts of your body. And yeah, I don't know. I'm just sort of tuning into like Tai Chi, Qi Gong, and a little bit around like how the meridians of the hand come into the heart and sort of go into the heart. Yeah. Is there something specifically special about the healing capacity of our hands? Well, our hands are electromagnetic. So if you align yourself with somebody else or yourself, that energy will connect up. And and it's like you, if you move your hands, it's like you have a magnet in your hands and the energy will follow. And every single person on this planet can do what I do. They can all do it because it's, it's, our, it's our birthright. But most people haven't been made aware. And so they don't remember that they can do this. And so it's just, it's about tapping into it again. And it's, and I am sure that our ancestors did this, our ancient ancestors. I mean, because they certainly didn't have modern doctors around they they knew how to heal themselves they also knew how to get themselves out of depression and how to feel better how to get their energy back if they've lost it all of those things it was what was natural one thing that was really interesting to me as i watched donna get into her work because i met her when she was 36 uh, no, 30, no 34 34 <laughs> she's 34 and she had just come out of her um her illness and she was just starting to get into her work and what was really interesting to me is that the energy the energies that she sees such as the meridians or the chakras or the aura she didn't have names for them she just saw them <laughs> and it was only as she began to study with other people that she found out oh somebody else has seen these energies and systematized it uh -huh. and so she began to realize oh, okay the meridians have been talked about for 5,000 years in ancient Chinese acupuncture books. And the chakras have been talked about by yogis for thousands of years. And the aura is in all the great art, religious art. And she sees nine different systems, actually. And um, so it's, <laughs> it's like this real interesting cartography, whereas... When I met her in 1977, and I, I had just come out of seven years teaching, as you mentioned, at Johns Hopkins in the, in the medical school. So <laughs> I had a different perspective about what energy is. A bit more energy. scientific. Yeah. <laughs> the capacity to do work. Energy has very specific One of properties. our very early arguments. <laughs> Uh, I'm doing. I mean, energy is measured in wavelengths and frequencies. And, and here she's talking about something that has memory. 
She's talking about something that has intelligence. <laughs> this is not the energy that I learned about in school. So, um, so th those were, you can imagine our dinner table discussions <laughs> in the early years, because I didn't, you know, come on, what, what, what are you talking about? But I, what I saw was that I saw that people were coming to her with serious illnesses, really by the time, by within a few years of her starting her work from, they were coming from all over the world and they were getting better. And so I had to pay attention to that. So, oh, maybe she does know something you know, that I don't know. So that was, that was the early time of our relationship. And um, we didn't work together at all. It didn't, it never occurred to me that we could work together because <laughs> what she did was, even if it worked, it was still so woo woo that I just, I just <laughs> couldn't really embrace it. But, <laughs> but you know, history, um, history proved that to not be the case. And that that's another story I can tell is how, how that happened if you're interested. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting. I'd love to hear that because, yeah, I think so many people coming into the word energy does get used um, a lot, especially in spiritual circles and healing modalities, and it does have the connotations of the woo, let's call it that for a sec, um, but then also your own personal journey with it, David, I think is just so profound in terms of how not you were the last person to come around, but you've you've harbored <laughs> your fair sense of reservations around all of this. <laughs> around all of this, um, and here you are now. Like you know, you're literally co-writing the book on tapping, which is an incredible book. But I will get into that a little bit later. But yeah, please share away, share away. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, so so we have this kind of detente where I'm appreciating the work she does, but I don't understand it, and I'm actually sometimes referring we. My office in Ashland, Oregon back then, where we lived for 20 years, my office was on one side of an alley and her office was down the other side of the alley. <laughs> and sometimes I'd refer clients to her. Sometimes she'd refer them to me. And so that was that. And so I, I went that far. But in terms of really understanding it, I couldn't really say I did. And um, <clears throat> in around 1998, I was running a supervision group for other therapists. I'm a psychologist. And so these were um, local therapists in the community who wanted to just get together to talk about their cases and get supervision on them. And, um, and one day, one of them came in and started talking about this tapping that she had been to a workshop and she was really interested in it and really found it amazingly useful. And I'm listening and I'm saying, you know, she's talking about how you go like that and you go like that and you go like that. And I'm saying, what the hell does that have to do <laughs> with healing psychological problems, for God's sakes? Come on. And that's what I'm thinking as I'm listening. I, w I was professional and polite. I didn't put her down, but on my mind, I'm being very judgmental <laughs> and just just trying to kind of steer her away from taking up time in my supervision group. <laughs> But, you know, you kind of have to eat those judgments because here I am talking to you, <laughs> advocating this method. So um, so anyway, 98, 99, she, she had asked me to help her write her book, Energy Medicine. And so we spent a couple of years really working on that book. We both went to half time with our practices and put our hearts into it and, and really um, kind of um, articulated a field that was just emerging. And, um, and so by that time, she had really identified the nine different energy systems that she was working with now for years, for more than a decade with hundreds and hundreds of clients. Hey there, guys. I know you're loving Donna and David. What an incredible combination. And just energy medicine is so profound, isn't it? Now, I'm just taking a moment out to ask you for a humble request. If you can please, if you support the Inspired Evolution by doing us a favor and hitting the subscribe button. Everything you see here is powered and empowered by your subscription. The channel grows, the guests grow, everything championing positivity is enabled by your subscription. 
If you can, please do us a favor, take a moment to hit subscribe. It really, really helps. Back to today's episode. And, um, and so we, when the book came out, we were put on a six city tour to um, promote the book. And um, that was in 2000 or 1999? We, we, no, we left for it in 1999, January. January, January 1999 <laughs> for six cities, and we're still on that tour. <laughs> <laughs> it, we, we had no idea it wasn't going to end. It just kept going. <laughs> yeah, so, so we sign up for a little. <laughs> more than a thousand appearances now. But in one of those early appearances, it was a weekend workshop, and about 15% of the people that come to Donna's classes are psychologists or, or therapists, rather. So um, they would ask me about this new tapping stuff, this energy psychology, it was called. It's also called emotional freedom techniques or thought field therapy. It's got different derivatives, but energy psychology. And they were asking me about this tapping stuff. And you know, you have some choices. You can um, keep your mouth button that you think it's a bunch of hogwash because <laughs> these people are obviously interested in it. Or you can fake it and say, yes, um, I know a lot about that, which I didn't. Or you can learn something. And just when you're ready to learn something, often the teacher appears. And what happened was that in this workshop, one of the um, participants was a psychologist and she it was a Sunday and it ended at noon. And she said, I'm part of a local psych group of psychologists who meet once a month on Sunday nights. And we're meeting tonight. And I wanted to invite you to come as my guest. And the topic was thought field therapy, which was the original form of this tapping um, as psychologists do it. So, uh, so one of the therapists had been learning this and wanted to demonstrate it. So he had asked, the other psychologists, if one of them would bring a client who they were having difficulty with. So one of the psychologists does, he brings a woman who has severe claustrophobia. She really cannot be in a closed space. She can't ride up in an elevator. If she's traveling on a trip, she gets those truck driver manuals to see how long tunnels are and because she couldn't go through a tunnel. She had to take alternate routes. So it was really affecting her life. So it was it was about a dozen psychologists in somebody's living room. And so they put the two chairs in the middle and the woman and the psychologist, not, not her therapist, but the one doing the demonstration of thought field therapy. <clears throat> and, um, and the rest of us are in a circle around them. And so I'm watching, I've got my skepticism and think, well, you know, it's, it's. but it started out, I was very comfortable. He asked her about her history with her phobia. And she said, you know, it's been about as long as I can remember. I've been just really terrified of enclosed spaces. And he asked her about the treatments and she'd been through a couple therapies to try to get help. And nobody had really cracked the code and, figured it out and so I'm comfortable with that. And then the therapist says, well, since you're afraid of elevators, let's use that as our benchmark. Think about being in an elevator and notice the amount of distress it causes in your mind and body. And so she envisions being in an elevator and she immediately is breathing harder and she says, it's a 10. So I say, okay, well, I was comfortable with that. That's a technique that's used in lots of therapies called um, subjective units of distress, zero to 10 scale. Uh, I was using systematic desensitization at the time. It's used to that. So I was very comfortable. So I said, okay, okay, this guy is not wacko. He's kind of <laughs> got some basic clinical interviewing skills down. So that's good. But then he starts doing these strange incantations. He's going and having her repeat, fear of elevators, fear of <laughs> elevators. Fear of elevators, fear of elevators, fear of elevators. And I'm thinking, oh my God, she's just taking hypnotic suggestions to deepen her phobia. This is malpractice. Do I have to report him to the ethics board? What's going on here? This is terrible. But after about two minutes of this, and it also involved some other things with eye movements and 
humming and counting, just nothing that resembles psychotherapy. <laughs> and I'm just going, oh my God, what is going on here? And but he, after about two minutes, he has her imagine being in the elevator again. And she says, it's a seven now. So it's gone down from a 10 to a seven. And I think, wow, what, what just happened? I don't believe my eyes. I don't believe my ears. I can't believe that it went down after she's been in, embedding it into her psyche. And then another round of about two minutes and asks her again to rate it and it's down to a five. And I'm going, what, how is that possible? I, th- I got it. This is probably a Stockholm effect where she's developed some affection for the therapist <laughs> and she doesn't want to embarrass him in front of her, his colleague. So, okay, so I see that. And then another round of tapping and it's gone back up to a seven. And I go, oh, okay, I knew it wouldn't work. These are just fluctuations that happen when you're doing things in front of a group. <laughs> but the therapist said, well, when it went back up to a seven, what were you thinking? And she said, oh, it's interesting. I just had a memory that I haven't had for decades. I was about eight and I was playing with my older brothers and their friends. And we had this big appliance carton, like something a refrigerator would come in. And one of us would get in it and everybody else would push it. And it was great fun. But when it was her turn, they pushed it against a wall and only one side had an opening and that's the side they pushed against the wall. And then they left her there with kind of snide remarks and there she is in the total darkness and she's too little to be able to maneuver her way out so she just starts screaming and screaming and now she's reliving it and it's clearly up to a 10 and I'm thinking oh my gosh she's really kind of provoked something that's going to really be a problem because she's she's now dissociated and she's really upset and so he just stays very calm and he gets eye contact, and he gets her to start tapping again. And he has her tapping on these points. He doesn't have any words because she's already in the intense, intense ab reaction, it's called. And you just watch as she's tapping, she calms down. She calms down more and more. And then he has her tap with words now and has her talk about the terror has her tap on the darkness, tap on being trapped and bring all that until she's able to remember being in that box with no emotional reaction. She's able to remember it without reliving it. So the, so what's, what's, what happens there is very interesting. Um, the, you, you bring up the memory and you're, amygdala and your limbic system, your emotional goes parts go into a threat response. So you're you're at a baseline and then you go into a threat response as you um as you remember the scene. But the tapping sends signals to the brain that are deactivating signals from the acupuncture points to the brain. I can explain that more later, but it begins it's more powerful than the memory because it's physical. So it brings the activation down so that right there, very quickly, you're seeing the person calm down. So then he has her tap on other aspects of this memory. So her resentment towards her brothers, her sense of betrayal by her brothers, the years that she's had this phobia, all, all he has her tap on every aspect, get everyone down to zero. Then they go back to the elevator and it's down, it had been a seven last rating. Now it's down to a three and he has her tap on that and brings that down to a zero. So in the space of like half an hour, he has brought her from a 10 to a zero. So everybody's watching and psychologists like to test things. So one of them <laughs> says, okay, there's a, you know, we're in somebody's living room and there's a coat closet. And he says, what if she goes into the coat closet and closes the door? So the therapist that's working with her is very sensitive. He says, you're not trying to prove anything to anybody. We don't want to re-traumatize you. If you get at all anxious, just open the door. But she agrees to that. She goes into the coat closet, closes the door, and half a minute passes. And 
it's a kind of long time, then a minute passes, and you can imagine a dozen psychologists all hovering <laughs> around this closet door, looking, staring in. Another minute, it seemed like about three minutes to me, it's a long time. Finally, the therapist knocks on the door and says, are you okay? She comes out and she is just absolutely euphoric. She's never had any experience <laughs> like this. And everybody then is kind of <laughs> congratulating her and congratulating the therapist, except me. I'm thinking, okay, okay, <laughs> I see what's going on now. This is a social psychology experiment <laughs> to prove how gullible psychologists can be. Some graduate student is doing this as a dissertation. <laughs> But it was And you're the case and you're the case study. <laughs> <laughs> was that what was going on? No, obviously not. <laughs> so that was enough to convince me to get some training in this. And then it changed it changed my career. It changed the whole course of my career. My God. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Because the, the first third of the book, you guys actually go deeper into the tapping technique and some of the detective work that's required within your soul. And it's like as you open up the space and you start to almost find things within your body and your system. And, you know, we can talk about psychological reversal with some of the other things that are coming up in there. And then the last two thirds of the book, you cover a lot of ground on worry, anxiety, PTSD, sadness, depression, habit change, addiction, peak performance, sport performance, um, harmonious relationships. <laughs> There is a, a a particular section on um, on disaster recovery for those people that are responding when they're in crisis, and there's a there's a quote that it opens with um, from the chair of the Veterans Administration Committee, um, and I think that's Charles Figley who first named PTSD, and he said energy psychology is rapidly proving itself to be among the most powerful one of the most powerful uh, psychological interventions available to disaster relief workers for, well, A, helping survivors, um, as well as helping B, the workers themselves, which is, that's that's quite a sit. Like, when you think about those places that people are going through so much and the energy of those environments and then being able to then work through that, through something like energy psychology and what you're describing here is tapping, um, yeah, that's that's quite profound. It's an amazing... Um... It was part of what really got me um, convinced that this is not just another therapy, that this is a real breakthrough. And uh, was in oh many many years ago, shortly maybe um, maybe three years after that story that I just told, um, I was starting to realize that people are going to disaster areas. The one that first brought my attention was Hurricane Katrina where um, tappers came in and worked with the survivors and had great, I mean, it, 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 if you just think of the simple model of the brain goes into a threat activation and then you send signals that lower that activation, <clears throat> it doesn't change the person's memory of the experience, but it allows them to remember it with out going into reliving it, and that allows them to be much more creative in it. So you have a technique you can use very quickly with people. That if it, it, and it, it, it can work with PTSD from an event from 40 years ago, but you can also step right into a disaster. And this has now been done in more than 30 countries because it's gotten you know relief um, disaster relief workers know that this is something that works, so they'll bring in somebody that can do it. And they can, you know, like supposing if you, if I encounter you right now and you've just been through something and you're hyperventilating and you're totally upset, I can just make eye contact with you and I say, I see how upset you are right now and I think I can help you. To feel just a little bit better so if you just breathe with me just follow along with my breathing and then you just guide the person to take some deep diaphragmatic breaths that just 
starts to calm the nervous system. And then once I really have that rapport with them, then I might say, there's also some stress release points that if you just tap on them, it will make you even more calm. And so we can just, just tap along with me on these points. And so that's a way that you can immediately engage a person. Now, for long term, there's, there's different techniques that you would use for more long term healing of the event, but it's, it's, a, it's certainly a dramatic context for providing this, this um, kind of a therapy. Hey there, Inspired Soul. So how are you applying energy medicine into your life? This awareness that Donna is sharing in particular, she's very aware of the energetics of stuff. I love how grounded David is in the intelligence that he brings into really grounding in the potency of this work into a real left brain, you have got this. And with Donna sharing everything in a really open space, how do you apply your openness? How do you invite more openness? How do you apply energy medicine? into your life. I'd love to hear from you in the comments below. Back to the episode. Donna, so you're aware of nine different energy based systems, but yet that there's tapping. Um, can you describe a little bit why it is, is it a bit of a silver bullet through the nine different oh. systems? Um, and if so, uh, can you must, describe why? It mostly goes to the meridian system, but it does affect all the other systems. Like, I don't know. I'll just take David's arm now. If Sarah was tapping right there, that is one of the places that you tap, what you see immediately is a sort of a spark energy. And then it starts pulsing. It pulses all the way up and it begins to pulse along with your, with your heart as well. And, um, and, and when it, when it pulses up to the brain, I mean, on the way it affects, I mean, your colors and your aura change, the chakras change. Everything in every system is affected by it. So, it, I mean, it is amazing. And the meridians are the, is it the only? No, it's not, but it's one of the only systems that has a definite pathway that they travel. And that steadiness somehow can then be a uh, an anchor to all the other systems in the body that just absorb it like a sponge. And it is it is quite amazing to watch it. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear Donna's understanding that she can see the energies. I I understand it in much more kind of, um, you know, unexciting terms. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> you, you, there, there are molecules in every cell, and particularly in cells that are on the acupuncture points. And those molecules, um, when pressure is applied to them, that mechanical pressure is converted into electrical signals. It's called piezoelectricity. It's a well-known factor. It's not just something that energy psychology came up with. It's called mechanosensory transduction. So you tap on these points, these molecules create an electrical impulse. And that electrical impulse carries along, as I understand it, the connective tissue. The meridians weren't found for thousands of years, it wasn't only till the 1960s that it was really scientists were starting to be able to identify them. So that's part of why acupuncture was not respected more is because it's based on these meridians and nobody can find the meridians. They're not in the <laughs> cardiovascular system. They're not in the nervous system. Just no one could find them, but they're hidden in the connective tissue. And the connective tissue has a lot of collagen which is a semiconductor. So these impulses are able to move along the connective tissue and Donna sees that the meridians are in the connective tissue. So she sees these pulses moving. Now, where do they go? It's very interesting. Is that whatever it is that you are thinking about. So if you're thinking about, for instance, an, your fear of elevators, then the parts of the brain that get activated attract that signal. So the signal goes to the amygdala, which is now activated, and it does its work, which is to reduce the arousal. So it's it's really a, a fairly simple and elegant system. Donna sees it much more, uh, a much more 
kind of full. But, but even in the way that David explains it, I mean, it's magic. It's just like magic. And it's, it's wonderful to know that it works and that that anybody can use it. And my own sense is that children in kindergarten should be taught energy tools and and all of these techniques because it empowers people to be able to take care of themselves. So it's, anyway, it is wonderful stuff. Do you have your book here, David, that you can show? No. <laughs> hey, you're Inspired Tribe. I want to take a quick sec. I wanted to share something today with you that is really dear to my heart. And it's actually what keeps the entire ecosystem around the Inspired Evolution thriving my one-on-one -on -one coaching. So it's basically coaching that helps you live a spiritually aligned life. I coach people from all different types of walks of life. These people are leaders and they're looking to have an incredible spiritual impact in the lives that they're leading for themselves and then also lead in alignment to their values. Now you don't have to take my word for it. Here's a few people that have also transformed through my coaching and here's what they have to say. Amrit is a fantastic coach. In a few sessions, he got to a depth that I'd only experienced before working with certain medicines. And He's gone through a lot of the struggles that you're probably facing. Then my corporate banking job wasn't really doing it. You feel like you're not making progress towards your goals. And Amrit's been a really strong, supportive figure in my journey. I'm more in control of myself. I'm kinder to myself. I actually have that vision and a purpose. I do feel like I'm a better version of myself already. Amazing energy. He was easy to talk to, which made me easy to trust him. Working with Emmerich at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning and really I was bouncing out of bed. Whenever I get off the calls with Emmerich, best money we've ever spent. <laughs> I would not recommend him because I don't want everyone to know about him and then I won't be able to book him. If he gets too busy, I won't get my turn. I would say absolutely. There's no way you can work with Amrit for a period of time without being transformed. So if you're considering him as a coach, do not hesitate because you won't be disappointed. As you guys can see, there's a lot of people all over the world from all these different corners experiencing incredible transformations. I don't think, if I can say humbly myself, that there is anything quite like this somewhere else online. Most people that you know have channels that you know grow and grow and grow don't really focus on one-to-one -one offerings. I have just found that it is the most profound space where you can bring yourself in a private container and really just share what's going on for yourself. And if you want to book in for that call with me, touch base, it's www amrit.coach forward slash life. That's www.amrit.coach forward slash L-I-F-E. There is a link in the show notes below to book in that call. And yeah, if you want to take your journey further, if you want to dive in deeper and you really want to live a spiritually aligned life, if it's for you, please do check it out. And without too much further ado, once again, for your spirit, for yourself, today's podcast. I was going to ask Donna, um, because we talk about thought field therapy there and you see everything, like you mentioned the word, like everyone's a lattice, uh, lattice of force field. Yeah. Can you describe what you mean by that a little bit and help us? Yeah. Wow. Well, um, I guess through all of those energy systems, the nine energy systems that I see, actually I see more than that, but nine is what I teach. <laughs> and I mean, there is space. There is so much space between them all. And so you can literally see like lattice works. Literally, that's what it looks like. And um, and there are force fields that have power and, um, and intention and brilliance. And I think much more brilliant than the brain. I mean, it, it is... It, it is amazing. They, they carry your story. They hold your memories. They, uh, they, when you, when you evolve and grow, uh, your colors change in your aura. I mean, everything happens and it's, um, and, and it's magic. <laughs> I don't think it's magic. I think it's, I think it's magical. And, magical. And, yeah. And, and the way about it, it's also, we can also describe each of the processes in scientific verifiable terms. So that's that's important for me as a psychologist. Aren't we a perfect couple? <laughs> she doesn't care about that stuff at all. <laughs> complimentary, complimentary. Let's let's call it complimentary. Um, yeah, the 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 interesting thing about the the different energy systems that you see as well, like the, uh, you keep mentioning that there's memory and intelligence. 
So do each of like different uh, different energy systems harbor different types of memories, different types of intelligence? This concept of our energetic fields holding yeah, our that's memories. Yeah, that's a good question. You know, you're the first person in what 45, 50 years who've ever asked me that. <laughs> but but it's <laughs> really something. But I think I see probably in the chakras the the biggest stories you see stories quite easily you trip on them and you know who this person is and you know if they're also carrying disease the chakras say so much the meridians though i think are leaders of of the intelligence to lead us all out of this stuck place that you might be in your chakras and and your aura you know as you move and shift and change your aura holds that information around you so that um it, it's just it's it's also a protection for any kind of negativity or illness coming in but it also you know it's 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 the loudspeaker of who you are and um i mean just it, they all all different yes all different. Yeah, tell the story of the woman whose brother was shot and he named work um her heart shot oh you should tell it you remember better than me it's a long time ago yeah. I, I i was working on her chakras yeah it's it's in it's in the energy well, you could tell. <laughs> well donna donna was working on you, you pick it up as soon okay. as you remember it. um donna was working on a woman and she was working on her heart chakra she was not touching it but just kind of spinning her hands over the heart chakra and then she... oh yeah yeah i i just felt like i was first of all i i I'd suddenly feel like i was her i had her feelings and her memory and something long ago that of like knowing empathetically that... kinesthetic sort of transference it's like yeah, empathetic wow. and kinesthetic but it's also for a moment you could almost feel you're the person you are the person and and i I, you didn't lose your identity. No, I didn't lose my identity, but you, you, you take that on you too. Knew, you knew what she felt. Yes. And I, it was like a, like somebody had, had it was, was gone. Somebody had died. And, um, and you go ahead from there. And, <laughs> and, and she said, I'm feeling like yeah. it's not a parent, but it's somebody that's really, really close to me. And I feel like I'm about four years old. And the, oh, before that, before she said all that, she just broke into tears. And so the woman, it's her first session with Donna, and she's <laughs> paying this person who's just bawling and just broken into tears, just crying and crying. And then as Donna composed herself a bit, she was able to describe that, that I feel like I'm about four and somebody's just, died and it's not my parent but it's somebody very close to me and now it's the woman that's bowling because when she was four her older brother her beloved older brother was um playing with the neighbor and they were playing with their father's um his father's gun shotgun and the brother um was shot and died and that was an incredible loss and donna manuel is just feeling all the tumultuous and the energy in the chakra, all the pain that's in the chakra, all the memory that's stored in the chakra. And as she balances the chakra, it begins to help to heal that memory. It begins to help to heal that trauma. And so what happened after this session, which was just a real breakthrough, profound session one, but it was this breakthrough session, was that it changed the woman's marriage because she had yeah. not allowed herself to love completely because she had been so wounded by the first person besides her parents that she really loved. And, um, and so she became much more vulnerable within her marriage and her marriage got much better yeah. over the coming months. Wow. <laughs> I'm going to digest that before asking another question. Um, the, what's present for me is osmosis, Donna. Um, you mentioned aura, so thank you so much for explaining that story, um, David, about, about chakras and memories and 
you mentioned before about the aura, Donna, and as I'm, my question is about, you also mentioned it had protective qualities, but then obviously, well, not obviously, but maybe obviously in this conversation, we're not limited to our skin suit, where it seems like we're much larger as fields than that. And maybe that's a worthwhile question. How large can we, do we get? Um, but then also <laughs> the osmosis, like how, how permeable are our energetic fields? What are we permeable to? Um, are there like, cause I'm sure there's, most people tuning in have a sense of fear and I think that's why they don't feel into energy, right? Because they're like, I don't know, I don't understand it, so I better not work with it. Um, but then, for, like, I'm sure like when I spend time in nature, there's some really cool stuff that happens like to the right. system, right? And so right. are, are things happening through osmosis there where I'm taking on energies of the earth potentially? Can you describe Absolutely some of that to me? Absolutely, you are. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. Um, you, you absorb the energies of the earth and it's, it's one of the reasons that, that learning energy medicine is such a great thing because have you ever taken a walk and, oh, no, the walk is over and I forgot to feel it, you know? It's like, that can happen to people like, just, oh, no. It's because your energy was disconnected from the earth. But there are simple things you could do, so simple, to make you be able to connect in with the earth again when you walk on it. And um, But in your aura, the aura, have you ever walked, have, has somebody ever walked into a room that you were in and you could feel them long before you actually looked, turned around to see who it was? I've known people who just filled up the room, you know, with their aura. And other people, you don't even hardly feel them when they walk in because they're just shrunken in. And I want to comment on what you just said about fear. I think to really understand energy and start to know it and how to really work with it, you can't have, your fear goes away because it's so, I mean, it's so amazing to and, and beautiful and safe, really safe to be in the energy fields of, of the world. And even, you know, I've never been afraid of people in my whole life. And I think it's because of partly that, that I seeing their energy, even if they, even if they were quote, somebody with a bad reputation, <laughs> I, you see other things. You see things of such beauty in their souls and in their energies that, that you know you're safe, so you don't ever feel afraid. You know, and it doesn't mean that, I mean, you might not know that, I don't know, I, I, I probably have erred in the way of, of no fear at times, but, but I've always, it's just been, life has been very easy in that way. No fear. Yeah. <laughs> and, she, and and that's I mean that that openness to life is part of your beauty and it's also gotten you in trouble oh, yeah, that's time. why I said I've errored a few times <laughs> so, <laughs> but in terms of fear everybody does have fear you know it's like it's part of living in the world today it's, it's frightening and uh, one of the things about the tapping book is showing people how to really like to reduce that fear so that you're it doesn't make the world safer to reduce the fear the world is still what it is but it lets you know how to navigate your way through the world much more uh in a way that is much more um, um intelligent really to to not be fear driven but instead to be to have your cognitive facilities um, in, in, um, at your disposal as you're figuring out how to deal with, with the crazy world that we all live in. So one of the things in there that pops up for me is uh, in the book you talk about tapping also being a deactivating and also an activating uh, magic wand, let's call it that, uh, <laughs> to sort of honor the left and the right brain at the same time. Can you talk about the activations and the deactivations and what's actually going on there? Yes, please? thank you. Energy um, is basically very forgiving and very um, positive oriented. It's oriented towards your health. So that when you talk about the aura, for instance, I'll get to what you're talking about in a minute, but when you talk about the aura, we use two metaphors. We use the metaphor of a spacesuit, that is, the aura is protecting you from energies that are coming in that could be harmful, but it also acts as an antenna to bring in energies that are really positive. So if there's somebody 
that's with you that has a really positive energy, that aura pulls it in towards you so that it's, you know, so you can dance together. But if there's somebody that's really negative, you put up the barrier. So, so the energy is working in both ways. Now there's now that activating deactivating is similar. Um, acupuncturists will tell you that when you pre when you stimulate an acupuncture point, it will find a way to do what's health pr promoting. It will find a way to do what needs to be done. So when so if the so going back to the woman with the elevator, when she is tapping and the um, the amygdala is in threat response and it attracts the signals, they deactivate that threat. But there's also another part of her brain, like the prefrontal cortex, that's problem solving, that is trying to manage stress. So it will that will also be up, um, particularly after she's um, kind of taking care of some of the initial fear reaction and how do I you know how do I solve this problem of the fact that my I live in a building that has elevators and so there has there's some problem solving so the tapping will also be attracted to that part of the brain where it will increase the problem solving ability and so that's that's kind of the the paradox of why some of the acupuncture um, signals are activating and some are deactivating. What you said before was that you can't really get it wrong as well because energy is the it's it's quite forgiving and it is positively oriented. Yes. 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 Yeah. Incredible. There's a question that's sort of just popped in the field for me, which is we've got our energetic fields, we've got our prefrontal cortex, we've got our minds, we've got I don't know where the soul begins and ends. I have no idea about it that either. I'm just very curious about it though. Where does where does our consciousness, our experience of uh, uh, this perception of life, sort of stem from in your uh, way of relating with the world, Donna? Potentially, yeah. Can you highlight that? You say the perception of life. Where does it? Well, where, where's where's the home of consciousness in our in our being? Is, oh. is the question, which is a big question. I know. Sorry, I'm just oh. felt good to ask it. Okay, I've got a few answers. <laughs> okay. mm. I mean, I feel it like it's all the way through all the energy systems. And the more you get involved with energy, the more you begin to feel that and know that and know where that consciousness. I feel a lot of consciousness in my heart chakra. And there is out from your heart chakra about a hand's length. It, it, well, it's something that this, this isn't a technical term, but I call it the assemblage point. I call it that because for years I had other names for it, but I call it that because who, what was his Carlos name? Castaneda. Carlos Castaneda called it the assemblage point. So I, I changed my names to the assemblage point, but it really assembles all of who you are in this amazing uh, uh, conglomerate of energy that spirals in a, it's not a point, it's more a, um, what is it? It's a it's a wide spasm of energy here, and as wide a sphere. a sphere of energy, and it hold it holds your perspectives, your values, your your beliefs, your everything, and your and your love. Just it holds it in a field, and if it's if it, if you're really aligned with it, it becomes your north node, and you feel guided by that. So your consciousness gets really involved in here. And right out beyond that is, I mean, if that really can really spark an energy that I see evolving in people, what I call a diamond inlay, it's just, it's out beyond the, the assemblage point that, and that diamond just sparks you to the heavens, sparks every wave, sparks to people, sparks back to you. And it, it is amazing. So I feel it mostly in my heart chakra, but in other places too. And so, as um, woo woo as that sounds, <laughs> um, I'll just say how I think of it is that before there was the microscope, nobody understood that there are germs. We couldn't see it. We we just didn't understand that aspect of life. And before there were telescopes, there was so much 
about the universe that we didn't understand, we couldn't see it. And what I've had to come to terms with with this gal is that she has a kind of special microscope that sees <laughs> energies. And so that becomes very interesting to me that she sees, because I know as a psychologist, we don't really understand a lot of processes. We don't understand a lot. We understand a lot about memory, but there's a lot we don't understand, like how the way that memory is in all parts of the brain. You know, it's kind of got this holographic quality to it. And that's that's not really well understood. So if she's saying that there's an energy right in front of me that is kind of helping to establish my identity, um, I, I think, okay, I should pay attention to that, that, that there may be something there that I can't see, I can't experience, but that really is going on. And she can talk about it in enough detail that it seems like it's very real to her. So that's one <laughs> level of, of skepticism addressed. But another level of skepticism is when she works with a client who is, for instance, really having some identity crisis. And she works with them at that level of what she calls the assemblage point and gets that assemblage point into a better energetic space. The client has breakthroughs in their understanding, breakthroughs in their sense of peace about who they are. So it's, um, so it's been an interesting journey to um, go from my judgments about her to um, <laughs> kind of saying, oh, okay, maybe she knows something I don't. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm... oh, sorry, please. Yes. Oh, it's, well, I was just thinking that when I had my private practice and um, <laughs> say, say I could see the assemblage points was nuts on a person. It just, it just didn't really hold all who they were. It was like it held all who they were not. And whenever I saw something like that, um, I knew that they were somehow involved in maybe a cult or something, something that changed everything that the, that they thought and believed Distortion. and felt. What was that? Distortion. Distortion. Yeah. Real distortion. And so it's, it was a life saving thing. It felt to me just to get back their own energies connecting in. And it does connect in with all of your energies. And yes, your brain too, but it was just, the brain is just one little part. I, um, yeah, as, as thank you so much for describing that. It's, it's, it, it feels a bit like surgery as you're describing the assemblage point and, you know, them like potentially being distorted and hijacked. And I think there's a worthwhile question in there to ask what, yeah, what causes us to not basically be aligned to our own truest energies? Um, I think that's a worthwhile question, and that is the question. But I will just remark before, David, when you were sharing, um, I had this visual insight, which is totally inappropriate for me to share, but but I had this visual insight of a stethoscope, and you were like listening and using Donna as a little round part at the end of the stethoscope <laughs> to try and help you find, find you. And I just totally inappropriate. I <laughs> wasn't meant to share that, but I just popped it in there. But, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, sorry. <laughs> Since that came across as rude as well, I, I should learn to shut my mouth when it's required. But the question still stands, Donna. Um, what does, yeah, what, what causes people to, uh, yeah, in their assemblage point, um, have sort of, I don't want to say, yeah, these distortions, these distortions. What, what well, causes I, I that to happen? Think, I mean, I think we are all so affected by other people. And when somebody comes in with an amazing um, vision of life and who they are and direction, and I mean, some people are, if they are not, really solid with who they are they can this feels so good this feels so wonderful to go off and um so usually i mean they, they need to come back to themselves but i have also seen it when somebody just falls in love they fall in love and what was interesting before is not so interesting the only interesting person is a the person they're in love with and so i i've seen it with a lot of different things and but 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 because consciousness is there, um, I, it, I, there is a pull to come back to yourself, unless it's love. <laughs> unless 
in love, but sometimes you can fall in love with a guru and that, you know, it's, I mean, that is an issue, but that's part of growth and coming back to self is evolution. I think it's, um, at this juncture where it's worth asking also how, how to become more solid. And you mentioned also, and the question was present, like, how do we connect to the earth? That was, we were talking about that before. How, how do we, um, yeah become more whole, become more centered? Okay, there's so many answers to that, but I'll tell you some simple things. Like the earth, I mean, the earth is so healing and because it's electromagnetic as well. I mean, it, it's meant that when we put our foot on the earth, that, they, that we're, we're really, the energy streams through us and we stream through the earth. The earth heals us and we heal it. And But if you are, all messed up in all sorts of ways. Suddenly, you you don't have a an energy that connects. And so, a um, really simple thing to do. Rather right? simple thing to do. Yes, please. You have, you have a stainless steel spoon. You get it right out of your kitchen drawer, and you spoon the bottom of your of your feet without any shoes or socks in. It will at least uh, hook up uh, the. Uh, the polarities so your polarities are at least hooked up to the earth and most people tell me it changed it, their experience of walking on the earth and so when we're walking on the earth is it recommended to be barefoot um because i know there's a lot of people that speak to grounding in that way as well or is that not it, entirely it, necessary it, and if so how long yeah yeah, so the well, engineering it's not, is showing up. wonderful if the if if it feels good to walk on the earth and go hiking. But sometimes you get stuck by stuff and all sorts of things. So I mean, I wear shoes, but I do spoon my feet, and so that my feet stay, so it'll go right through the shoes and hook me to the earth. And uh, so, and and you know it when you're. I mean, I'm looking out this window right now, and the trees. I mean, I can. I feel myself pull to the trees, you know, it's just an amazing thing. And, um, and I don't want to say that this, this is probably a little off the subject, but you have a wonderful energy, Amre. <laughs> you do. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to I'm gonna shy away at this particular point of the conversation. Lots of purples and reds. Lots of purples and reds. Purples and reds. Actually, I was going to ask you what colors you saw after the show. <laughs> I just wanted a little speaky little insight. You know, touch wood. I'm blushing, though. Lucky I'm brown. No one can see. <laughs> You've got lots of other colors, but those are the two main ones furthest out. And and honest, you spark so much and it comes in and out of your field, which is really nice. So that even if people can't see the color, they'll feel that purple and that red. And the red makes you laugh. And the purple makes you, I don't know, there's a wisdom. You've come to wisdom and wisdom guides you. Oh, look at all your show you've got on. That's what you do. Wow. <laughs> Touch wood. That is very humbling to receive. Very humbling. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for those practical insights as well. And I think, yeah, such a such a simple technique. And I think we uh, like I think when the average person does start to tune into some of this energy medicine work, like I think tapping is is so beautiful because it's so immediate, it's so available. We discussed the, the potency of the hands, we can tune in. But then also, yeah. The, the the spoons has really got me thinking because we we do think about like we're still so physical based even when we're like we're so limited in our thinking sometimes or I can speak for myself I'm visualizing if I want my energy to neutralize I have to go stand in the ground with my feet in the earth for like 15 minutes but you know the description of hey spoon your feet allow the sort of energies to they can go through the rubber you know if you can yeah. really hook up and it's just like that opens the mind whoa to like a whole nother yes. sense of possibility when it comes comes to energy as well yeah and, and then oh sorry please yeah continue no, you, you can answer the last well, question it, okay it's just that okay so if you've spooned your feet you know the rounded side of the spoon and it's got to be stainless steel because stainless steel hooks to the energies of your nerves and so and suddenly the polarities are linked with the earth and um, but you will feel it not only coming up through your body, but you'll feel all 
all of nature around you, the trees and the wind and the everything. You'll feel it through all of your energy systems. So it's a great thing to do. Sorry, one little question for you, Donna. You mentioned stainless steel. Are there any special properties of copper, just out of curiosity? Yes, it is. It's very interesting. Many years ago, I I don't use many tools. I, I use a spoon and a, a magnet sometimes because magnet can take away pain easily. But many years ago, um, I, I got involved with... Uh, some Egyptologists or something from Egypt, and they all used copper. If they held copper in one hand and um, and the magnet in the other, copper and magnet, that they that you could really feel the energies of things, and that was very very big. And I I remember many years ago, yeah, copper. I mean, I knew what copper did, and I would say, what. Here's what copper does. I don't think I've ever told anybody this in my life because I never really taught it. But copper really does hook up to your chakras. You can feel the copper, uh, copper, and and it makes your chakras come alive and brings things to the surface. Since there are seven layers in each copper, I mean each copper, each chakra, <laughs> um, the copper pulls things to the surface. Wow! Thank you for asking that. So I could know it. <laughs> wow. Oh, it's fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, David, there's a there's a point in the book where I think we're getting, yeah, I find this happens a lot for me generally. Um, it's like the, the mind has this, okay, let's, let's make this change. Like I'm ready to, I remember back when I struggled with depression, that was quite some time ago, but nonetheless, one of the key things that had to be shifted was my relationship with honesty. And the mind was like, okay, I'm going to embrace honesty. But then there were so many things in the system that were in between, like actually integrating <laughs> that shift, these internal um, these internal conflicts when we say we want to change, but then deep down inside, we actually don't. And yeah, the, the book speaks to a large part of these internal conflicts. Yes, we, we wrote the book to cover a broad range of issues like depression, like addictions, um, <clears throat> like PTSD. But we started each chapter with the, the parts that everybody experiences. So the depression chapter starts with sadness. The addictions chapter starts with habits. The um, PTSD chapter starts with anxiety and, and um, so you, you kind and worry. And so you have something that anyone can self-apply in the beginning parts of the chapter. And then as it gets more complex, as it gets more serious, what we really say is that for this, you really ought to be working with somebody that can guide you through it. But we're going to show you what you can do while you are working with them. And we're also talking to the therapist, saying if your person is depressed, here are things that you can do. And what, what I think the book's biggest contribution is, is that there's more than 100 tapping books out there. And when Sounds True came to us and said, we really want you to write the premier book on this field, and it was a big challenge. What, what, what do we do that 100 books didn't do? And what we did was we looked at the best practices that psychology has to offer for depression or for anxiety or for PTSD. And we showed what those best practices are. And then here's where you would bring tapping into it. Because in my 30 years as a therapist before I had tapping and my 23 years since I have, it's like it turbocharges it. It's not that I don't still use the best of what I had before. I don't just tap, but the tapping, bringing in the tapping just makes it so much more powerful, so, so much faster. So in the case you're describing with depression, there are so many aspects of it and you can tap on each one. You can with tap, a round of tapping only takes a couple minutes. So you can really begin to work with, accepting yourself as a person who's facing depression. That's where it often starts is the self-acceptance. So you're not just trying to change yourself because you hate who you are. 
you're really appreciating that you're a person who is dealing with this challenge. And then from that, then your psyche begins to cooperate more because your psyche feels like you're cooperating. And that, that, so you're, you become more of a team with your psyche and, and you, you literally will say things like, even though I'm depressed so much of the time, I deeply love myself and accept my feelings. You begin to pair the problem with a real positive affirmation so that when you think of the problem, the affirmation, I love myself and I accept my feelings becomes <laughs> part of the formula becomes so so that's so so then we move on to the aspects of it and and the aspects my of depression you know maybe many but often it has something to do with loss and something to do with trauma from the past and or something to do with a situation where what what life was presenting just was so much so different from what you needed so so all those can be precursors for going into depression so you tap on each one you go into those memories of those times so and so so with with sadness it might be one tapping session you're feeling you're feeling much better about what you were sad about but for ongoing you know really chronic depression it's really a, a journey through and that's why we suggest that it be done with a practitioner, with a therapist or someone that really is able to guide you. But the, the therapist doesn't have to know the tapping. It's better if they do. But as long as the therapist understands how to work with depression, then you can do the tapping part on your own. So, so, so we hope that the book will really make a difference in people's lives. That's not just another self-help book that gives them more things to feel bad that they're not doing. <laughs> well, I think written by the, the two of you as well, it's, it's very open, but it's also very pragmatic and practical, which is, which is phenomenal. Um, it's almost like a manual and a toolkit. Yeah. Like you said, it's a, it's a tool. It's a, something to add to your toolkit and the, 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 the different ailments, different places to tap. Thought field therapy was the originator and they uh, they had a much more sophisticated set of points that varied like if it was dealing with depression it was different points than it was dealing with anxiety or with grief different points but um, what Jerry Craig did in founding emotional freedom techniques was that he found a one-size-fits-all set of points so he's working <laughs> with, so in our book we work with 12 points. That's all. So the technique Can is Can I say very... that's handy or am I being a dad with <laughs> the dad yep. jokes? Sorry, I'll stop. <laughs> it's handy. Only 12. Yeah, it's very handy. So it's easy to learn. And once <laughs> once you've gone through it a few times, you kind of have a body memory. So you just know where they are because they, they just follow along the body. And, um, and, and so that really... So you don't have to understand when we begins... You don't have to understand what each point does. You just have to know that it's sending signals to your brain that correct what needs correction. And so that's that's all that you need to understand. So you guys have been doing this work for quite some time. Um, and I don't know, maybe it's just because I run this podcast that different like things feel like they're opening up more and more. But the more people I speak to, they do feel like um, people's openness and awareness um, to things such as energy, um, the awareness that we're not just solid matter. Um, some people argue that the age of Aquarius is nigh. What, what, in, what is your experience between the pair of you of the receptiveness of people to these more open uh, modalities? And what does that say to you about the, the current shifts that are happening in the world at this present time? Well, I, I think that it's, it's wonderful because uh, with the whole world in turmoil as it is, in just at the same time, there's this very positive understanding about energy and that we are not just these physical beings that are born and we die. You know, there's more, there's so much more and we don't understand it all. But the more you 
get involved with energy and find out that, wow, this is at our, at, at, at our uh, fingertips and we can do it and we are empowered and, and you don't feel so unsafe in this world. You feel like you can maneuver through this world and it helps everybody. And it's not so important. I, it's so important. <laughs> well, we, when we started on the road around 2000, 1999, 2000, after a workshop, say we had 300 people and we would say at the end, you know, well, we are leaving town tomorrow and we don't, you know, we know you're excited about this, but we want to leave you with some resources who in the room knows an energy medicine practitioner, whether it's a doctor or a massage therapist, but somebody who has that. And maybe one or two people would raise their hand and we'd put that person's name on the blackboard and, and their practice would take off. And, and take off. <laughs> so, but, but today, when we ask that question, virtually everybody raises their hand. Yeah. They it's all like know. The world has yeah. changed. So it's, it's really, you know, it was, when when energy medicine came out in 1999, it was a or 1998. 1998. Yeah, it was a really different world. It was it was it was just a very outside the paradigm, but the paradigm is shifting now. Yeah. And I think um, I think for real reasons, we're, we're we're our culture is kind of desperate for um, deeper understandings of what is going on and what needs to change. And between the pair of you, do you harbor a vision for the future of psychotherapy, psychiatry, and medicine in general, adopting more of uh, this work? Oh. Uh, yeah. Well, I really feel this next century is going to be about that. That It won't be just Western medicine or, or the woo-woo stuff. They will come together and blend because that's what it's really all about. You see Western medicine already getting into more energy things like like an MRI machine or I mean that's about the electromagnetic stuff I mean they there are more and more things like that and then integrative medicine yes and in and, and, and when uh and in classes sometimes there'll be a doctor who has come simply because what happens to a doctor or a nurse in that field is they will begin to realize there's something more here than I mean, they know it's not just physical. My gosh. Yeah. So it changes happening in this world, and it's really good. <laughs> Guys, I'm going to put a link to the tapping book in the show notes below, but I think even the website, um, the Unimath, you guys train facilitators, and it's a rigorous two-year process that people go through, um, that people can actually learn to understand these modalities on a really deep level. Um Probably not for everybody. For those people that really want to actually master the craft, it's you know, it's it's really a, a deep dive into the work for those those. And there's a souls. light yeah. So yeah, there's a please. light that you don't want to deep dive that deep. That we have all sorts of videos and things. And and somebody wants to... yeah. There's there's a lot of resources. The but for the tapping, uh, there's two there's two websites. There's the energy medicine website is. EdenMethod.com, Eden, E D E N, Donna, EdenMethod.com. And the tapping we website is EnergyTapping.com. And we don't teach people to be practitioners in that, but we list the organizations that do that we really feel do a good job about it. So um, all the information is there, ordering the book is there. So um, we, we hope that your listeners will uh, really find it a, a, youth, a resource that, that makes yeah. their lives work better. That's what it does. It makes your life better. Everything gets better. <laughs> I feel like this episode has been an episode almost of uh, the Star Wars where <laughs> diving deep into the Force. Um, and then also there's been a real... Hawaiian vibe present for me for just the concept of how deeply woven into their understanding of the worldview, like that concept of mana really is. Um, and just, yeah, just how potent um, the work around energy really is for our well being. And I just want to honor and acknowledge you both for look, there is a deep sense of gratitude for your time spent here with us today. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much. And yet, obviously, it's 
today's conversation just stands really on the shoulders of your both of your lives work <laughs> and 47 years together um and i'm sure and i'm sure david's skepticism has helped even helped to refine <laughs> eden along the way and eden has opened david along and just you know just that incredibleness of you know just your life's work and just us being able to revel in this conversation today so thank you for your time and energy yes Oh, well, energy, yes. Uh, but then also, thank you guys so much for who you guys are and just the way you're embodying the work. Like I said, when I opened the episode, 81, 78, like more <laughs> life than some of the 50 year olds that I know in touch with. That sounds very judgmental. I shouldn't say that. But <laughs> you guys, thank you so much for embodying and carrying thank the work that, the way that you do. So grateful for you guys. Thank you. Thank you. You're a light. I'm so glad you're doing this work. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Alrighty guys, you tuned in all the way through to the end of another episode. This episode with Donna and David was so incredible. It was heaps of fun having two people to interview. If you love this episode, if you love the Inspired Evolution podcast, please do take the time to hit that subscribe button. Everything on this channel that you're seeing that's happening is powered and empowered by your subscription and I can't thank you enough for it. Now, on screen you will find an episode with Jeffrey Allen, and other episodes to take you further. Jeffrey is also an energy master. It's such an incredible gift, also a Mind Valley teacher and author. And we've had some really great conversations with Jeffrey on the podcast. That's on screen for you now, amongst some other journeys to make sure that you stay inspired to keep evolving. I'll see you in the next one.